All right, so uh, we're gonna get started with Raja. Raja is at Yule Hub and he'll be uh, presenting on building desktop applications, which he has been maintaining for Yule Hub and Pumas for some time. So please take it away. Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, so let's begin with uh, what uh, an enterprise grade integrated Yule binary means. So, uh, we, we, uh, you, let's say you have an application, uh, Julia, it's written in Julia. So, obviously, it uses Julia packages, and uh, you do have artifacts and uh, dependents and prerequisites for this binary. And you want this binary to ship to an uh, enterprise or any, any, public, any public medium. And uh, we, 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 like, so in this talk, we will provide guidelines on what you should take care while shipping your Julia application. So uh, let's begin with this. And uh, so our talk is divided into multiple. Yeah, our, uh, our talk. Uh, like, uh, we we do have three major operating systems: Linux, Mac, and Windows. So we will start off with the common features. Uh, these are these common features are applicable for all three of them, uh, just as in the slide says. So the first feature is obvious. Uh, you, you have to extract your Julia binary. You're shipping the Julia binary. You don't expect uh, the customer to have the Julia binary, of course. And uh, you're shipping the, your sys image or a PKG image because you don't want your customer to like, wait until the, your packages get pre-compiled. So you ship a sys image or a PKG image if it is 1.11 and, and above since PKG images are now uh, uh, like, uh, it's, uh, like, uh, it's not dependent on a single system. So, and uh, of course, there are other uh, prerequisites as well, like artifacts, registries, and manual files, or third-party libraries. So we do have pre-installed and post-installed scripts. So let's, let's talk about that. So pre-installed scripts are the ones who ch we check the prerequisites for your installer. You don't want your uh, user to install the software and then figure out, okay, okay, I, ha I, ha I, needed, I needed a .NET framework, I needed this particular library to be pre-installed. But, uh, uh, and now your application is not working. So you, do, you don't want to be in that situation. So you check for this prerequisites during the installation. That's where the prerequisite install script comes in. And of course, uh, the check also uh, ap applies to uh, whether if you, if you have a 64-bit Windows application and someone is trying to install it on a 32-bit, of course, your pre-install scripts is going to come up in, in that situation as well and tell the user, okay, you can't install this software because uh, this, is, this is made for 64-bit. And the post-install scripts, uh, these are the scripts which you, uh, uh, for example, uh, like you write the launcher on the system, like during the installation. You, can, you, can't, you, can, you can't write the launcher uh, like in the binary itself. You have to write it on the system because uh, you need to include the absolute paths. And of course, you do have the uninstaller as well in case of Windows. Uh, uninstaller has to be uh, written on during the installation and uh, it needs to be registered with the Windows registry as well. So these things need to be handled in post install scripts. This happens after the installation and extraction is done. So the obvious, obvious thing with any installer is, of course, uh, you will be asked for the install location. And uh, the one specific thing for your binary is the Julia package server URL. So uh, since you uh, like since you're shipping this to an enterprise or even any, anything, even for a regular person as well. So Pack enterprises do tend to have sometimes uh, their own private package server, a PKG private package server. They might have an instance of a pr private pa package server running on their uh, private cloud. So this is where during the you, se you set up your Julia to point to this cloud and make sure uh, it uses the, the private package URL and not the public one. Of course, you can default it to pkg.julialang.org, which, which is the default. If user is just clicking next, 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 and that's, that, that's what they get. They can still install packages and stuff like that. And uh, I did talk about the prerequisite check. So we, sh we not only do this prerequisite check during the installation, we should do it ev on every launch. Th 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 that's my opinion, by the way. <laughs> and uh, we should do it on every launch because uh, a system is a dynamic environment. It can change, like a uh, uh, user, user would have moved your files, a user would have deleted your files, anything can happen. So you, there should always be a way to repair your, repair your installation. And the, uh, checking the prerequisite during the launch is the only way to do it. And there are other, uh, there are other things as well. Let's uh, imagine the scenario. Uh, 
there's a there's a Windows administrator, and the administrator is installing the binary and is using his admin account. And the Julia depot path, you want it to be in the end user's home directory. And uh, if admin is installing it, it will go to the admin's home directory. And if there is a non-admin who is using the same system, he won't be able to access the installation. So that's where the launch script comes into picture. So if uh, the admin has installed the software and he has logged out from his admin user, now the non-admin comes in, uh, he double clicks on your application. It, uh, like the if, if the launch script uh, checks for the prerequisite, it checks whether the user has the depot path, and the depot path has all your prerequisites, like the artifacts, your package source, everything. If it doesn't, it will copy it for the user. And this is just a one-time thing, and uh, the check is not really uh, taxing on it. But, uh, you, you can do a minor checks, like uh, checking if the file exists, checking if a directory exists, which shouldn't be too much taxing for your uh, startup. And uh, yes, the second one is keeping the original files in the installation directory. OK. Oh. <laughs> uh, keeping the original files in the installation directory. So. Uh, you should always keep the original files in your installation directory because uh, as an archive. Because uh, if uh, the window, like the admin, could have installed the uh, could have installed your uh, app on a mounted network drive, or he uh, or your profile itself might be a roaming profile where you can log in from any system uh, within the enterprise, but you none of your local files are on, the, are on that system. The local files are on uh, some centralized system. So, so th these are the scenarios where uh, the copying thousands of files from your source to the user's home directory would, would be taking a huge, very long time, as, especially in case of Windows. So yeah, you, sh you should be careful on this. So that's the reason you should use compressed archives. You copy the compressed archives to the user home directory, and you extract in there. And uh, yeah, you, you get your, you get your uh, entire depot path that you want the users to run. So yeah, so I will get to the Windows. Uh, Windows, you, you can write the Windows installer using uh, any of these scripting languages, NSIS. Uh, initially, Julia was using NSIS in the past. Now uh, Julia uses in script. And of course, the good old install sheet, which has been there for like more than a decade. And, uh, and the installer options should always depend on the privileges. Like you have a Windows binary, a uh, non admin is running, the options that you're getting in the installer should be different. And if an admin is running, the, of course, the options will differ as well. So that's, your installer should not be a static thing, it should be a dynamic one. That's, that's what it says. And uh, yeah. I think I ran out of time. So, yeah, and uh, uh, have a good uninstaller. Like, you should clean up your files. And code signing your binaries. Okay, I'll just skip through these things. Okay, the Linux, the Linux, what we used to do is uh, we used to have a shell script, a self extracting shell script. Your entire binary is written into a shell script, which is a bi uh, like as a binary. So a user will get a single file, it will just execute that file, and everything gets extracted through that file. That's a pretty easy one. And uh, to verify this, you can always use the .asc file. Even Julia uses the same thing. And uh, Mac, you uh, PKG, uh, .pkg is recommended for your application, and, uh, as opposed to a DMG, because uh, a PKG gives you more leeway. Uh, you have to extract your files in different folders and files. Uh, and yeah, and you do need Apple Developer uh, Program if you're planning to sign. Of course, you have to sign your binary, and this is definitely required on this. Yeah, so I think I'm up with the time. Yeah, this was my talk. Yeah. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? So I saw you put quite an emphasis on pre-installation scripts and post-installation scripts. Yes, I did. But why are you not delegating that to the bundle itself, like MSIX bundle, for instance, no longer have these scripts, opportunity to have these scripts, but it can put your desktop icon in the right place uh, depending on the manifest file, you, uh, how you configure a manifest file. 
Oh my my binder can be like this is a generic gen guide and the binder can be an EXE or MSI. Yeah, and yeah. And yeah, it it will have uh, all these features. Yeah, yeah, but what would you do when you don't uh, would it be real a real issue when you don't have a pre-installation scripts and post-installation scripts? It might be, but uh, since you're checking in the checking for the prerequisites in the launch script, you're covered in that. Even even if you ship it as a zip file, your pre-installation like your launch script is gonna check for the prerequisite yeah. and it's going to yeah. copy it for you. Yeah, but I'm thinking that mm -hmm. since the bundle is itself signed, right? Yeah. So it's you just check the signature and it's kind of I think it's assured that it's the right bundle, right? Yes. So. Maybe okay. Uh, maybe uh, we are up with time. We 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 can catch up on this later. I guess. Yeah. I'm sorry. Couldn't get the question. Uh, so le let's give Russia another round of applause.